Um, well, once again, thanks for, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's fun to be here. Um, I did spend, I am at Oregon State University now, and, um, but I spent 18 years at Montana State University. So um, I kind of know the, the, um, the Northern Plains and um, had a lot of exposure to some of the animal agriculture out there. Um, so my, my talk is um, adopting policies and priorities um, that might help encourage some of these, these activities that, that we'd like to see. And um, I guess one other observation that I had is, you know, just walking outside in the, in the lobby in the 10 years that I've been, or 12 years or more that I've been seriously doing climate change, um, there's been a sea change in terms of what's happening, in terms of people not, yet, not embracing as much as, but seeing the economic opportunities associated with some of these changes. And that's a really good thing. It's going to, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I was doing climate change research in Montana. Um, and a group of um, growers gave us a t-shirt. And the t-shirt said, Montanans for climate change. And it showed people shivering and things like that. And so it was a, it was a very different environment that um, it, we were questioned why are we doing climate change. And I think that has been a, a really kind of a, a theme going on here is that you know, there's winners and losers. There's some people that will benefit from this. And I think what we need to do as a whole is to, is to try to design policies that are also climate smart policies. And that will speak to the benefits of doing both of those. OK, so the themes I want to talk about, um, once again, I will probably not spend a lot of time on this. But just what do we mean by this climate smart agriculture concept, some of the policies and goals, and how do we get there? And once again, integrating economics, as we've heard in many of the presentations this morning, is really critical. It's got to be economically viable, economically sustainable, or you know, then it's just an exercise if not. And so we really need to pay attention to that. Um, Background, of course, science has always led to better policy. We'd like to see it lead to better policy faster, but um, I think that's been the history of this integrated research. But the details are important, as I said. We need to know how do we integrate um, across the sciences. And there's been, like I said, a lot of work in the economics area that I'm involved in on um, efficiency as well as other values that we, that we care about, poverty, vulnerability, um, natural capital ecosystems, and so we can, let me just move a little bit from that. Okay, so climate smart agriculture is kind of a very recent term. It's been defined by FAO in 2010, and it's composed of basically three pillars there. One is to increase um, sustainability, sustainably increase product productivity and incomes, adopt and build resilience, and then um, deal with the greenhouse gas emissions wherever possible. And I think this was a, a, a form of yours, too. We're looking for that sweet spot that we can, and hopefully it's a little bit bigger than the red one that you showed. I'd like to see that be expanded. Um, so why is it needed? We heard this from the earlier presentations as well, is that we're going to have to feed a larger population. Um, we've got climate change happening, and that can lead to reductions in many cases and lower incomes in very vulnerable areas. And so a lot of the CSA, Climate Smart Agriculture, was very concerned not just with the US, but with what's happening in developing countries and people that are pretty much living on the margin. Um, and once again, in 2005, um, agriculture did account for about 13.5% of the GH, um, G emissions. Um, so the, the approach then for the climate smart agriculture is basically coordinated efforts toward these resilient pathways. Um, but we've got to do that in the following way. We've got to build this evidence, which I think is what, um, Megan, it was just great to see your study and see some of the other studies that have been out here in terms of building evidence, identifying viable options and tools that will assess these different technologies. And then also, as we all know, we've got to increase the local institutional effectiveness. Um, we've got to foster some kind of coherence between climate, energy, and ag policies. And then we've got to link um, climate and ag cultural financing. This is incredibly important at the end. It's not a new approach. It's been around under different names. Um, 
there's a short history there. Like I said, it really has been in the last five years that it's been kind of recast as this climate smart ag as opposed to um, just dealing with a changing climate or with sustainability and resilience. Um, it's, this is kind of a nice um, schematic here. It shows that it builds on what was first referred to as sustainable development, poverty reduction, environmental risk. And then it's also come under the little more encompassing name of a green economy where we're looking at carbon emission reductions, resource use efficiency enhancements, and now today's version is more of a climate smart agriculture. And I think that's because of two concerns. One is not just dealing with the environmental um, concerns and sustainable development concerns, but also this issue with food security and um, agricultural production improvement. So um, looking at a little bit broader and putting all of all the pieces together here. So there's been this kind of a schematic that's not mine. I borrowed it from um, uh, John Bennington. And the, this schematic really talks about these goals of climate smart agriculture in terms of a safe operating space. And the safe operating space really is from a very um, you know, high level view is we want to sort of increase that sweet spot or that safe operating space in there such that the bigger it is, the more resilient we as a planet, we as a society will be in terms of being able to adopt to more changes going on and things like that. So if, if that sweet space and that safe space is really the space that's sustainable is very small, then we're kind of pretty fragile in terms of some of the, um, some of the things we have. So those three um, lines there, the orange lines, are basically represent some relationship between food production and climate change. So the climate change due to the food system means that as we get more climate change happening, uh, as, I'm sorry, as we get more food production occurring under the existing um, technologies, we're going to see more climate change or more greenhouse gas emissions occurring. The, um, the global food needs one is a graph that just represents our food needs um, in a temporal sense as population increases. And then finally, the maximum food production is just this trade-off between food production and climate change. So we can play around with those graphs. And so what we can look at here is that if we want to look at um, the global food needs under a changing climate, what we can, whoops, see what's happening here. Okay, right. So what we're, what we're looking at is policies that might try to shift that curve down such that we are increasing the safe space by looking at new global food needs. And what would some of those be? Kind of eliminating the waste in the food chain, being able to make better use of the food that we have. Okay, so for any given climate, at any given climate or weather um, point in time, we can actually, the food needs from the um, primary production would be um, reduced because we're having less waste going on. If we're looking at how to improve maximum food production, we'd be shifting um, this other graph. That's a little slow on the out uptake here. And so improving maximum food production would be looking at policies that would be shifting that um, curve out. And those policies would be things like drought management, adaptive grazing methods perhaps for, for livestock, and maybe matching livestock intensities to the environment. And then finally, the third graph is how to mitigate um, climate change from agriculture. And in this case, we'd want to increase that safe space by actually trying to think of it as shifting the, um, the climate change due to the food system graph back. And that would be things like mitigation policies and stuff. Um, increase on-site greenhouse gas, um, decrease the on-site greenhouse gas emissions, capture CO2, et cetera. So that's kind of how this, um, this uh, graph has been used. So what is the US doing to enhance climate smart agriculture? Well, as, as B said, and um, we've got these climate hubs. There's a lot of activities going on that really are in the, that fall under this umbrella of the climate hubs. Um, 
We've got global research alliances, Feed the Future, Climate Clean Air, and then the U.S. Global Climate Change Initiative. Um, these are um, all pieces, really important pieces, of what's happening in the policy arena to promote a more sustainable, climate-smart agriculture. So this alliance has been um, the most recent of these lists of um, global efforts. And it's a number of countries and a number of organizations. Um, the problem is it doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. There's nothing mandatory about this. It's all voluntary. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. So the key characteristics, once again, it's voluntary. Um, however, it's trying to develop these enabling environments that would encourage the adoption of some of these approaches. Um, and it's also engaging with business foundations and civil um, society, et cetera. So turning to a little more policies in the US. So the question that we ask in a lot of the research I do is, so what about the Farm Bill? What's happening with the policies that are, we currently have in the Farm Bill? Do they incentivize resilience to climate stresses that are consistent with climate smart agriculture? What types of tools, policy tools, might be available to promote a more climate smart agriculture? And most importantly, what do we need to know? And what do we know? And how, how is that gap being, being filled? So the Farm Bill, everybody here knows it's basically the primary ag policy tool. There's different titles in the Farm Bill. Um, 12 of them, the ones I circled, are primarily the ones that work to um, deal with some of the climate smart agriculture. The three orange ones deal with commodity programs, conservation, and crop insurance. And then we have a research title in the Farm Bill, which indirectly is probably the strongest um, piece of legislation that we have to continue to fund some of the research that's needed. Megan, I think you know, your, your, yours is a great example of this type of um, policy. And then the distributions. So I looked a little bit at some of these um, different um, titles and, uh, um, in the Farm Bill, and the plus next to it means that I think it is moving us in the direction of climate smart agriculture. So conservation compliance um, basically limits conservation um, requirements to crop insurance premiums, et cetera. The farms that have highly erodible lands or wetlands have to follow this conservation program um, to receive the government payments. and. Um, so the question is, what happens with the conservation compliance? It's a shift toward working lands. There's an equip program. And so in terms of my safe space diagram, I think that the conservation can result in an outward shift of the food system curve, which is going to increase that safe, that, um, that safe space and helps to stabilize food production. So manure management to curb greenhouse gas emissions. I'm trying to do a little bit with respect to um, the, um, the animal agriculture. Costly but, but effective for greenhouse gas emissions is these anaerobic digesters. There's a, there's a great study at WSU that was done around 2010. Um, currently, the economic viability hinges on how to finance and the potential revenues, so the operating costs versus the capital costs. The revenues um, from somebody operating a digester come from electricity and renewable fuel, the fiber products and the nutrients that are byproducts, carbon credits if they were to exist, and then payments for ecosystem enhancements. And once again, another case of shifting and making that safe space bigger. Commodity programs, I'm just not going to spend a lot of time on these because I think most people are familiar with them. But the commodity programs, covered commodities include wheat, oats, barley, et cetera. They can cause this safe space to increase, perhaps by improving the maximum food production. But as we all know, there is some downsides with some of the commodity um, programs. And so they, as far I have a plus and a minus up there. They may increase their income, make them more resilient, but it doesn't necessarily encourage adaptation to other programs that we may want in to deal with climate change. Drought management. Basically, the drought management um, policies could encourage flexibility and increase resilience. The earlier paper that Justin did is a great example of um, 
what could happen if we were to get proper drought management policies in place or better drought management policies in place. And so once again here, I think I've got the drought management could also basically increase the safe space by sort of shifting the, um, the maximum food production curve out. Um, adaptive management, AMP, grazing management, this is another um, uh, policy, short intensive grazing followed by long recovery. So once again, looking at how do we graze those, how do we graze those lands. The claim in some of the studies is that cattle grazing using this um, AMP may increase productivity and store more CO2. So that's one of the claims. The adaptive, and it's adaptive it's, it is an adaptive type of carbon capture and storage. The question is it really hasn't been quantified. And in order to quantify those claims, we would, have to be, we would have to be able to go out there and measure the increase or the decrease or the change in soil carbon um, as a result of this AMP versus um, the current system that might be in place. And then we need to know the economic dimensions, what's happening to the weight of those animals, what's happening to some of the products going on. Um, and once again, this could be a case of increasing that safe space for climate smart agriculture. So designing policies, just a few more minutes and then um, we'll take some questions. Designing policies, fundamentals is that incentives matter. Economists are always coming back to this. We need to understand those trade-offs and the opportunity costs. Um, I can skip over this. Okay, so some of the tools that we have that we're developing for better informing our policies are both at the landscape level as well as at the um, farm level. So once again, our premise is that farmers and ranchers are the ones that are making the on-the-ground decisions. And so I think it's really important that we develop tools for them to use. And so at the landscape level, these are the ones, these big models, the SWAT model, the EPIC uh, model, and then we have one at Montana State, I mean at Oregon State called the trade-off analysis model. It started at Montana State. Um, at the farm level, these are the ones that we were, um, that have been, we've been looking at, ag tools or ag biz logic, which is the one that um, B um, talked about is comes under these farm level decision tools. And basically they're designed to help growers or ranchers make operational choices. Um, the, ag, the ag tools on the, um, on the right hand side there is basically our software, which, can, which is being developed now web-based and it has a number of sub programs in there, ag profit, ag lease and ag finance, and then ag environment. This is once again, the same, um, the same flavor and theme that Justin was talking about in terms of what he was looking at. So the farm level decision tool, this AKA, we've nicknamed it TurboTax platform for two reasons. One is that it's gonna take information from the grower's um, tax returns and populate it into this program. But it's also one that allows the growers to be able to fine tune it for their situation. So what has been, what are their list of inputs? What has been their, um, their experience in terms of um, yields or outputs? And so the decision tool has these kind of components to it. The first is we want to use this platform to ask questions, for the grower to ask questions, you know, should I change my crop rotation or my um, grazing rates and invest in new equipment or invest in other kinds of inputs? based on expected changes in climate and crop yields that may come along with some of the um, climate changes that we're seeing. The other thing is it has to, it's gonna gather this data um, on their inputs and other spatially relevant data on their yields. It's gonna take all of that information and run it through the scenario, the scenario that we have, um, these um, sub, subroutines that we have using different scenarios to look at basic outcomes and how the economic and environmental outcomes will change as the scenarios change. So we've done this with the wheat 
and this is what um, B was refer referring to. We ran through this um, ag tools with and without climate change, and we show that, yes, in order to deal with and adjust to climate change, this farmer, this, um, farmer would be better off switching his annual cropping rotation to something that includes seed oil and canola. So once again, just comparing those, those two um, bottom um, circles there. So the applications, so I was thinking a little bit about the application of ag tools to livestock, and Clark Siebert is doing this. And I think one of the big um, pluses of a tool like this is it's going to allow the growers to make sense of all of the data that they have, that they're, and make sense of it on something that means something to their operation and not just here is a typical ranch. And so I think trying to drill down and get it to be as relevant as possible. So what, um, what we're doing, and Clark Siebert is actually doing this in Oregon for some of the livestock operations, is setting up these baseline budgets and information, making them site specific, um, talking with growers and with ranchers to decide what are the scenarios that we need to be addressing, and then to explore whether those under those scenarios, are their current operations economically viable? Incorporate precip forecast, download, downscale climate data and information. And then I think step four is really important. When I use TurboTax, I tend to um, do a lot of different scenarios on how should I, what should I be doing with my income? Should I be investing it here and here? And being able to compare those. Well, Ag Tools is going to allow a rancher or a grower to do the same kind of thing, is to be able to say, how much better off or worse off would I be if I were to switch um, how I manage my operation when we see changes in climate coming or changes in prices or changes in technology. So it's going to be used in a relative sense as opposed to an absolute sense and being able to allow the grower or the rancher to be able to explore those and understand those trade-offs. And you know what? I can stop here because this is, this is kind of repetitive of what other people have, I think, come up with, what is, or has presented. What does climate change mean for agriculture, some of the direct and the indirect impacts. And so this gives me a flavor of what are the kind of things we need to be modeling and capturing in a tool like Ag Tools. Um, yeah, I can just stop there. Great, thanks. And I know we have the governor coming on in about five minutes, so. Yeah, but I think he's um, late. I think he's probably coming a little later into lunch, but. Yeah. Okay, great. Nice presentation. I like it. One question for me, maybe I missed it or you mentioned it. Uh, in Western Hemisphere, we don't have that much. Um, problem with production of agriculture or food or whatever. Uh, I think the problem is mainly the distribution of it. Where sure. does the distribution uh, lies in comparison with safe space that you have created on those? Yeah, uh, I don't think it is actually captured that well because that's a much high level um, issue. You know, I think you're exactly right. You know, we talk about food security. We probably have plenty of food on aggregate, it's just not in the right places at the right time. And so I think that that is an area that hasn't been captured, at least in that diagram. It has been, people are paying a lot of attention to it. You know, Oregon, um, we're pretty wealthy in terms of, you know, the outside world looking in, but we've got a lot of hunger and a lot of issues. And it's, you know, so it's not just the aggregate that's important, it's the distribution and it's looking at the winners and the losers. And usually the losers are oftentimes low income. And so paying attention to some of those, those concerns as well and not just always feeding more. I think the other thing on, a little bit on that food demand is you know, that there's a lot of effort going on on trying to minimize the waste. If you look at some of the statistics on how much food is wasted and thrown away and not consumed or used, you know, if we can minimize that, then the amount of land we need to bring into production or other types of, um, may be much less than we think if we can get some of those numbers down. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. 
Yeah. So in this uh, scenario that you talked about, uh, do any of these tools and policies take into consideration the, the nexus of water, energy, food, and sustainability? The one I didn't talk about, the TOA, the landscape level tool, will do some of that at a bigger, higher landscape. And um, in that one, what we actually have is trade-offs between some of the environmental outcomes. And then we've modeled the agricultural outcomes as a grower may produce a commodity as well as produce um, ecosystem services, for example, or carbon offsets. Or the commodity, he could make choices or she could make choices between producing some of the grain crops for actual grains versus um, energy. And so there could be those, those kinds of things brought in. But at the landscape level one, at the um, farm level one now. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's a great example, one of USDA's new um, calls for proposal, not USDA, I guess it's USDA, is it that the one that has the food, food systems, energy, and water nexus? Yeah, that one is, I think, really, really important. It's hard to, um, yeah, we need to capture those complexities on, you know, what gives there. Yeah. Can I ask another quick question? Sure. Yeah, I don't know for sure. It's not my area. There probably is. I guess there's probably something where people are looking at the consumer demand, how much more are people willing to pay. Could this be the more interesting part of what you have is, you know, can this be somehow marketed that this was, I guess it gets into the area of sustainable or, you know, not organic but produced sustainably. So. I think the climate smart agriculture, like I said, that whole movement grew out of FAO and a lot of concern with developing countries and looking at, you know, what are the, what are the options and what are some of the ways that we can keep um, that safe space from shrinking down more and more. Because if we just do business as usual, the projections are those, those you know, curves are going to start condensing in and then that safe space for um, producing food and sustaining our climate will be shrinking. And so the idea is how do we keep it from shrinking down or, ex or get it to expand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks.